hey, looks like it's working this time because we just had technical difficulties. We have overcome them once again. Hello, Eric here. I am the Grateful Chef. Thanks again for joining us on this episode of Cooking in the Grateful Chef Kitchen with Eric Eisenbud. You know how much uh, gratitude I have for you guys. Sorry to point a knife at you, but you know. My kitchen, my rules. Remember that from last week. Um, so yes, welcome to our kitchen. Ooh, sorry. See, producer's yelling at me for that one. <laughs> welcome to my kitchen. And who is yelling at me? But it is Lynn, the producer, the camera woman, and the wind beneath my wings, who without her, I couldn't do this. Can't, and I, and I yell. I only have to. She yells with her eyes, are like laser beams. <laughs> but anyway, welcome to anybody who's new, who's the first time seeing the show. Uh, again, I'm really grateful that you uh, have chosen to spend this 45 minutes or an hour or hour and a half. You know, I lose track of time. Um, and uh, we're doing a great show today. Let me get my board. Today we're doing. Something that's near and dear to a lot of people's hearts, and that is Steakhouse. And why are we doing Steakhouse? Because we have in our live studio audience, which you could be a part of, just reach out. We have some friends from the UK in town, and they love steak, so went right into we don't we're it. doing Steakhouse. They don't get it in the UK. They don't get it in the UK. No. Do you get no beef in the UK or is it just bad beef? That grass just fed, nice no marmalade. <laughs> no, no. Okay. So we've got Elle and Andy. Hey. Elle and Andy. Thank you for Welcome. joining us. Thanks for coming in, guys. We're uh, happy to have you guys here. And uh, again, you ever in uh, Neck of the Woods on a Wednesday, you see an announcement for the next Facebook Live? and you think that you can make it to Warren, New Jersey, just reach out, private message me, email me, uh, whatever you need to do, and if there's a spot, you, you, there's a spot. So, it's that simple. All right, so, before I go over this, I do want to encourage everybody um, and remind everybody of our brand new website. It is Eating with Chef Eric, www eatingwithcheferic.com. We have been populating it as best we can. Lots of travel information, a new section of my favorite tools and ingredients. Um, there is what, we're, what I'm doing cooking in, like last weekend, last Saturday, Chef Justice Stort and I, remember he wrote that book, Mastering the Art of Sous Vide Cooking. He and I did a pop-up dinner for 12 people with wines, we did an eight course meal and we pulled out all the stops. All the pictures are on the uh, eatingwithcheferic.com website. And they're also on the group. Again, I will ask that you please share with your friends our group, the website, uh, continuing to build traction for your hopefully favorite chef, Eric Eisenberg, and that's me. Hey Google, stop playing. Oh. Hopefully, Oops. there, a little Grateful Dead in the background, but they're free sharing music. They don't really mind, so if you're listening, Facebook, Please. don't don't ban my video. <laughs> <laughs> so, we have Paul Deboni with us tonight. Oh, Paul. Let me bring this back, because we didn't really talk about it. All right, so, Steakhouse at Four Button Week. Here we go. So, we are doing a 45-day dry-aged prime New York strip. We are doing cream spinach, classic cream spinach. We are doing potato wedges, which are real easy. I'm gonna show you how to do it all because that's what we do here, real life cooking. We do it together. I'm not doing this alone. And if I can do it, so can you. And we're doing the classic iceberg wedge uh, salad with a homemade Roquefort dressing that uh, is real easy to do. And I will encourage you to lose the bottle and make your own. It's real easy and it's really, really good. All right, so. So I, I need to get back to you. Go ahead. Who's Paul Devoney is here, of course. So, hello, Every hello, week. hello from Paul. Hello, Sherry, Paul. Sherry Heslip says, so I'm Mark hello. for the folks from the, the UK. Cheers to you. Um, John Amodio is lurking in the background. While you're doing that, I'm just going to yes. chop this spinach for the cream spinach. So, so go ahead. Watch that. Um, and then we also have Sharon Colombo. Sharon. And then, let's see 
Rosie. Jamie, thank you for joining us again. Sean Margulick was making reference earlier when I was glaring at you about making too much noise. Uh, crack that whip. Crack that whip. And Fran Trust me, she doesn't need to be encouraged <laughs> to crack the whip. Uh, we've got Fran Greenstein. Hi, Fran. She says, teach. 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 That's what I do. Love to teach. And we've got Benjamin Fisher, who says, I love dry age steaks. Awesome. So we're going to talk about all the ingredients. We're going to talk about everything here um, as we go along. So the first thing that I want to do is we are, yes, dear. Oh, no. We've got oh, your Sean. brother, Todd. Hey, Todd. Mike, Mike Vassell. And awesome. we've got Sean Martin. Back Fantastic. Here. All right. Now that we've got all that business out of the way, let's do what we're here to do, and that's cook. So the first thing I want to do is we're going to get the cream spinach going. So Lynn will follow me over to the stove. Yes, Lynn. And we're going to get going. So, a couple things about this recipe. Uh, first, I'm going to just turn the pan on. I've got about three, four tablespoons of butter in the pan. So we're going to let that melt. And we are basically making what's called the bechamel sauce, which is best, which is a one of the mother sauces, and um, it is basically milk that has been thickened with a roux, which is flour and fat. So in this case, the fat is butter. We've got all-purpose flour. I'm going to go over the ingredients. So all-purpose flour. We have chopped onion. So whenever you add a uh, an item to a roux, it becomes a compound roux. Real simple. So we're going to make a compound roux using the onion. We're going to use the garlic. We're going to use the flour. We're going to use the butter. So first, first things first. We're going to melt that butter. And we are going to get our onions going. We're going to do the garlic and the onions. You don't really want high heat here. You don't want to brown the onions. Bechamel is a white sauce. Um, so that is the same thing that you will do, like if you were going to make a macaroni and cheese. If you're making a bechamel sauce, you're adding cheese to it. So once you know how to make a bechamel sauce, your whole world opens up. I'm using a wooden spoon. I like using wooden spoons when I make roux and when I make cream sauce. So that's what we're going to do. Yes, Lynn, any comments? Some comments. We're going to wait till later, but I, I, I need to remember steak and cutting board. Um, so we'll come back to them later. But we have uh, Ted Ushfaluzi and a special guest this evening, Miss Sophie Eisenbud. Hey, Soph. Awesome. Little shout out from Seattle, Washington. For the That's daughter. Awesome. From my daughter. Yes. For those that don't know. Okay, so we've got our butter melted. I'm adding the onions and the garlic. We're going to get these onions going. I've got the garlic over here. It's about three, four cloves of garlic. Whenever I cook, and I let's say I'm following a recipe, for instance, and it calls for two cloves of garlic, I'll put in three or four. I like garlic. I kind of feel like a lot of recipes will understate the garlic because they're, you know, they're afraid that it'll come out too garlicky. But it all depends on the garlic you have too. So. Um, oh, it smells good over here. Yeah, already. You got butter, you got onions, you got garlic. Garlic. What could be bad? What could be bad? And we have Denise Klein. Hi, Denise. You got to get here in that studio audience I was talking about. Yeah. You and Nancy got to get over here. And I'm going to turn this up for the sake of getting this done a little quicker. So, again, we're just cooking the. Uh, Cooking the onions, we want to sweat them. That means no color. We want them to turn translucent. That's exactly what we're doing. And we're going to cook them just until they're soft. And then we're going to throw in our flour. Yeah, so I can already see that the onions have lost their whiteness. They're beginning to turn opaque. And I'm doing this in a big pot, all right, because you're going to have the cream sauce, you're going to add the spinach, you want to, you want to do that. And I want to check real quick in the oven, I have the potatoes in the oven, which 
which I'm going to show you what I do to prepare them, but you know, the whole magic of television, we got to do it ahead of time. These are looking great. I turned the oven down, so I'm not worried. We'll take them out later. All right, here we go. We're going to come in close and look at your ovens. Yes. Look at that. So you can see they're turning a little bit clearer. Can you see that? Beautiful. One, one day that's enough with that process of how do you smell? I smell perfectly fine. All right. Just a little bit more, guys. We are in no rush. Cannot rush perfection, right? And just for the folks that are joining late, what are you making again? I am making a classic steakhouse side, cream spinach. And let's talk about the spinach. I'm a little bummed because it's getting harder and harder to find what I call dirt spinach. Dirt spinach is spinach that grows in the dirt that you buy with the stems and the dirt and you, you take it off the stems and you rinse it and you clean it. It's, it's curlier, it's not that baby, baby spinach. To me it has very little natural flavor. Uh, a lot of times it's grown hydroponically, uh, which is not a bad thing, it's just I prefer dirt spinach. All right, so before these go any further, now we're adding the flour. So we've got the onions, they're translucent. Is that your key? Translucency? Translucent, the, yeah. So when it gets translucent, yeah, yep. flour. When they get, that's, what, that's when you know they're soft. So I'm mixing the flour, it is grabbing onto the butter, and it is making a compound roux. So it's coating the onions. You can see now it's like a paste. See? Beautiful. Okay, we want to just toast off the flour just a little bit, get rid of the rawness. All right. Nice. Now, the next thing I want to add is I'm going to add the milk. Because the bechamel is a thickened milk. So here I have two cups of whole milk. What I want to do is, to avoid lumps, you want to add a little bit at a time. Turning this down, it's down. And you want to add a little bit, and you want to whisk constantly. And it gets pretty thick. You just want to make sure that you whisk out the lumps. You don't want a lumpy bechamel, that's for sure. You want to show them the different stages of what this looks like. So I've added a little bit of milk, and you can see it's real thick. I'm gonna add a little more milk, it gets a little thinner, and this is just to make sure we, got, we have no lumps. Once you get it to a certain uh, smoothness, and you know you don't have any lumps, you can go ahead and add the rest of your milk. And it's quite thin, so now, going to do is we're going to let it come to a boil and that's going to begin to thicken. So the way a roux works, when you make a roux, you've got the, you got the fat, it's melted, you add your flour. You mix it together and what happens is every flour molecule gets coated in the fat when it becomes a paste. When you add a liquid, it allows those flour molecules to now separate and thicken the sauce. That's the basic science behind a roux. So I'm going to turn this up a little bit and now we're just going to let it bubble and reduce. So I'm going to cook it until it's slightly thickened. All right. And then we're going to add our spinach. And we've got Paul Florio, he's made it. John Cragen is with us tonight. Beautiful. So slowly whisk in the milk. All right. Once it starts to thicken a little bit, we're going to add a little Parmesan cheese, which is completely optional. 
for this recipe. So if you don't want to use it, if you don't have it, you can still make this recipe. But I like a little Parmesan cheese in there, and I may not use it all. Okay, so Jane, yes. Jane Darker said hi. And then we also have Drew Miller from Amish Country. Country, Ohio, nice. and Ma Matt Ross has a question about your bechamel, and is there a good way to put a twist on it? Well, like I said, bechamel is the base for a lot of sauces. So, well, not a lot of sauces. Um, you can do like um, a like a lobster thermidor kind of thing, where you add seafood to it, like a lobster cream sauce. You can do the like macaroni and cheese, grown up macaroni and cheese using uh, nice cheeses, you know, instead of just like uh, Velveeta or, which, you know, I'm a fan. Um, or, or, you know, or cheddar. You can use Gruyere, you can use, uh, you know, nicer cheeses to make a grown up, do it over rigatoni instead of like elbow macaroni. Um, turkey tetrazzini, I mean, is it fun? Anything that you would have with a cream sauce, you can, you can start with a bechamel. Yes, Lynn. And we also have Jay Jeff. Hello, Jay. Jay. All right, so this is getting thicker. A little bit. I'll have to go a little bit more. Turn the heat up. Do you have to watch it the whole time? Well, you, do want, you don't want to really walk away from it because you don't want it to scorch. <laughs> and the idea is you want to get this thick enough so when you add your spinach, it kind of sticks to the spinach. Going, getting it boiling. So, in the meantime, because this isn't going to take long, I'm going to put our steaks on. You know, I'll talk a little bit about what I'm doing here. You've seen me use the Thai charcoal. I used it for the uh, dinner party we had on Saturday. It worked amazingly well. So, I'm going to go ahead and throw our steaks on. Do a little multitasking. Here they are, the star of the show right here. These are the 45 day dry aged New York strips. Beautiful marbling, they're prime. And basically I have just salted them uh, about an hour ago, let them come to room temperature. And um, I'm gonna pat them dry, put a little bit of oil on them. And we're gonna throw them on the grill. Yeah, um, actually you perfectly answered that question, uh, Sean and Margaret asked earlier. But... What? What did you do? Did you freeze them after dry aging? Yes. And how long can you freeze them for once you've dry aged? They will last longer in the freezer than they will last because you're going to eat them. So you will you will eat them first um, before you have to worry about them, you know, going bad. And they won't really go bad if they're vacuum sealed. Um, they're just, um, you know, they, they freeze really well, so I wouldn't... Uh, I wouldn't worry too much about it. All right, I'm adding my Parmesan. I'm going to leave, leave a little bit towards the end because I don't want to overpower it with Parmesan. And this is the spinach. So I was talking about the dirt spinach. So I wasn't able to find dirty spinach. I, but I was able to find bags of curly spinach um, that did not have any dirt on it, you know, which I guess was a time saver. So as you can see, We've added that spinach, and those were two 10-ounce bags of uh, curly spinach. So I, some, I had to take some of the stems off. So here we go. Look at that. So now we're, you can see our cream spinach is forming. Now I want to season it, of course. And the classic seasoning, along with salt, is white pepper, and then a nice grating of nutmeg. Brings out the flavor of the spinach really well. And there we go, look at that. That, is, that will continue to thicken. I'm gonna put on some white pepper. I have a separate pepper grinder for white pepper. White pepper is same as black pepper, it's just got the just white. Just got the outer coating removed. And my nutmeg is right here. I'm gonna rasp in a couple of turns of nutmeg. So Gloria. And hi, Gloria. Um, what type of salt did you use? I use kosher salt. Could you use other kinds of salt, or is it just sure. whatever you've got in your pantry? Yeah, I have uh, like a large, coarse sea salt, 
but you always have to be careful and I'm so used to using the smaller grain kosher salt that it's very easy to over salt if I'm using a bigger salt but kosher salt is good you can feel it you, it'll, it spreads nice I'm going to put a little bit of that in right now salt pig you'll see this on my website in my favorite tools this is an olive wood salt pig I love it holds a lot of salt it's easy to grab a nice pinch all right put it in there and this is done I want you to see the consistency of this I am going to taste as always taste 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 Really good. I'm going to put the rest of this cheese in. Even more salt. And even more. From, from Drew Miller, do you do your own dry aging? I do. I do my own dry aging. Yes, I do at home. And we've got from Lisa Brand. Hi, everyone from Freezing Vermont. Hello, Lisa. All right. We're done here. This is good done we're going to get our steaks on so this i'm just going to leave on the back burner we can always reheat it later going back here now let's get to our steaks now clean up my mess all right steaks i patted them dry because when you salt them they want to leach out some a little bit more liquid even though it is dry aged and I am gonna go with a little drizzle of avocado oil it's a nice neutral oil high heat I just really want to drizzle and then I'm gonna apply with my hands just a nice little rub on the both sides so again I bought these to room temperature you can cook them right out of the refrigerator that's fine um, one thing to know about dry aged steak, it cooks about 25% faster than a regular steak. So you got to keep that in mind. All right. All right. There we go. So we have Matt Applebaum with us tonight. He wants you to start cooking the steaks because he has to go pick up his cake. All right. Steak's going on, Matty. Look at this. Look at that. Killer. Steak's going on. And then we also have Nino with us tonight. Hello, Nino. And Gloria just called you Salt Bay. Salt Bay. Hey, don't call me Salt Bay. I don't <laughs> like Salt Bay. Is that because he drizzles salt down his bare arm? Yes. Have you guys well, seen does, Salt Bay? He doesn't do that anymore. Oh, he stopped? Yeah, he fell apart. So, so, I think he probably does it still. All right, so using this great Thai charcoal. So which one of these was charcoal? Gonna let this go. Notice they they're sticking to the grate. Uh, you probably guys know that things will stick, and when they are done and ready, they will release themselves. So you don't want to force it. I'm gonna try the light. See if it's too bright. Okay. That's the fan. Oh, the light. Sorry. Oh. Uh, it's a little light. How's that? Too bright? That's okay. Good. Nice. All right. That's a beautiful thing. Let's let that go and go over to the cutting board. We're going to make our dressing, and I'll keep my eye on those steaks. That's like watching grass grow. Yeah, and the steaks are, the, the, the light makes them look really yellow. Okay. So. All right, first thing we're going to talk about is our potato. I'm doing potato wedges. Couldn't be simpler. Got a potato. We're going to cut it in half. You got me on the cutting board here, honey? I do. Cut it in half. And then we're going to cut three wedges out of each half. All right, obviously I've done some, they're in the oven. So cut it in half and then angle your knife and then angle your knife again. And you've got three beautiful wedges. Today, my putting on a glove because I want to put on some fat now. You can drizzle olive oil over this. Now you can season these any way you want, seriously. Whatever you guys have, that's what I did. I pulled out a bunch of stuff. This is bacon fat. So I am going to make a little bit of the bacon fat. 
rubbing on my gloves and I'm just going to basically rub each piece of potato with the bacon fat. I left the skin on these, the ones in the oven doesn't have the skin on. Really it's, there's, you know, it's not, uh, it's really not that serious people. It's potato, it's spices, okay, good. So we've got that nice and oiled up. That will give the spices something to stick too. So I have a bunch of things here. I took out some gra granulated garlic. We're gonna sprinkle that on. Again, whatever you guys want works great. All right, I've got a little smoked paprika, also known as pimenton. I'm gonna sprinkle a little bit of that on. Careful, because it is strong. You can use regular paprika, okay? I have some onion powder here. I'm gonna go in with my fingers, grab a pinch. And we can hear the steak sizzling in the background. Nice, a little bit of onion powder. And I also had, in my pantry, a barbecue potato chip seasoning that I made for when I made potato chips. So it's got a nice little sweet piece of sugar in there, so a little brown sugar. So I'm just going to add a little bit of that, do it up high so you get good coverage. And basically, we've got potato wedges. Okay? We're going to toss them around in the seasoning. Going to stick. These are going into a, I like a high heat, 400 degree oven. I use convection. If you have convection, use it. And uh, take about 30, 35 minutes, depending on the size of your wedges. Just keep checking them. Turn them halfway through. They get nice and crispy. And those are the potatoes. Let's check our steak. Hello. See how, oh, what a sear, what a sear. I'm coming over. Nice. That is gorgeous. I want to be able to go back to your uh, cutting board. Awesome. Board. Okay. Because they want to me ask about your cutting board. Okay. And I got a cool spot over here that I designed so we can... It's really hot. I got uh, six things of charcoal in there. Maybe it's a little too much. <laughs> well, that's how you do it. You learn. All right. Let's go back. So now we're doing the Roquefort. Great, easy recipe. We're starting out with some mayonnaise. Okay, it goes in. You're basically going to mix everything, all the ingredients together. We've got a little bit of buttermilk. We have a little bit of sour cream, and I'll put the I'll get the recipe online for you guys. A little bit of sour cream. We're gonna do a couple of shots of Worcestershire sauce, Lee and Pare. Excellent. And a little bit of Tabasco, a couple shakes. Is that English? It is English. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was like the shout out to the crowd. <laughs> I'm like, all right. Know where your food comes from, people. Yes. Checking the steak again. And from Bill Deal, what kind of, what brand chef knife are you using? I am using my favorite chef's knife ever, Misen. M-I-S-E-N. It's uh, my favorite chef's knife. It is available at $60. Go to their website, and when they ask if you're going to buy it, how'd you hear about us? Specify that you heard it from me, the Grateful Chef with Eric Eisenberg. Uh, I get nothing for it, but maybe they'll send them a knife. Send me a knife <laughs> so I can do a giveaway. Uh, all right. So I have mixed the all the ingredients in this, and now we've got Roquefort cheese, real Roquefort. Don't skip on this part. Um, you want to just get nice pieces in there, nice chunks, and then we're going to mix it all up. This is uh, pretty soft. It's been out for, you know, about an hour or so. And you can use your whisk and break it up. And here we got the Roquefort dressing that, rumor has it, this is from the um, Ritz-Carlton, their recipe, so... 
it's really good and it sure beats the bottle. Alright, and that's as easy as the, the, the dressing is. Alright, we're going to focus on the steaks because remember they cook a lot quicker. Mmm. Yes. Beautiful. Laura, your comment on the avocado oil being really great for your keto diet. Awesome. And Patty Wapp asked if you asked if you make your own buttermilk when, when using a little bit. I do, I don't, but I did notice that they started coming out with small bottles. Instead of having to buy, you know, a giant thing, I was able to buy this. Nice little small bottle. Whole That's Foods. so cute. Yeah, it's about fine. Alright, why don't you eat a cake? Do you have half of the milk? Huh? What's buttermilk? Oh, let's see. What is buttermilk? It's a good question. Anyone out there have a great explanation of what buttermilk is? Sour milk. Help your help out your chef buddy over here. Alright, these are cooking really well. Hopefully not overcooking. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take them off and we can always put them back on if they're not cooked enough. Can you give a quick rundown on what you're making to it again? Yep. Let me get a new sizzle platter. Because now you do want these to rest. Oh, Here. also a uh, question from Jamie Parisi. What is the cooker you using? This cooker is a little homemade gadget I came up with when I uh, when I discovered this Thai charcoal that, that I've been playing around with. Basically bricks of charcoal burns super hot as you can see. Um, so this is a hotel pan. There's a rack in the bottom of the hotel pan where I set the charcoal and I started it in my chimney starter right on the stove. I started it, uh, get them white hot. I put them in on the rack in the hotel pan, and then I. This is actually the grate for the bottom of a deep fat fryer because it's uh, pretty rigid. So I, I, I went with that, and um, I want to uh, do a little disclaimer here. So I'm going to say to you, um, if you don't have proper ventilation in your home. I do not recommend you do this because like all charcoal, carbon monoxide is, is produced and you got to make sure that you have a, a ample uh, ventilation to do that. So um, keep it outside if, if you don't. don't. Certainly don't do it if you have one of those vents that pulls it in, filters it and throws it back into your house. You don't want to do that. This gets, this is 1200 CFMs gets pushed outside. So I'm not even worried about it. That, that's why I could do this, but please do not do this at home unless you have ample ventilation. That's my disclaimer. There we go. Kevin, right. Kevin McQueen is a big fan of the fire. Yes, cooking with fire. All right, this is really nice. So we're letting these cool. Let's go back over to the cutting board here because we're going to talk about the lettuce. Well, I, usually I like my steak medium rare. However, is that good? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I find <laughs> that, and you know, check this out. I find um, that dry aged steak is better, almost closer to medium. Something happens. I, I can't even explain it, but um, I've tried eating the dry steak rare, and it's got a little bit of a chew to it. But something happens, similar to when we were. When I cook the uh, American Wagyu, um, like I was afraid to overcook it, so I did it medium rare, and it was good. But then I said, you know what? Let me throw a couple of these slices back on. And once it became closer to medium or almost medium, it was sublime. It was crazy good. So um, you kind of with, with dry aged beef, you got to throw away what you think you know about steak and kind of relearn. Yes, Lynn. Okay, buttermilk. That is the slightly sour liquid left after butter has been churned, used in baking, consumed as a beverage. 
And we're going to hit, hit up on your... Uh, yes, we're doing a classic wedge, iceberg wedge. What am I hitting up? Your cutting board, so I don't forget. Oh, cutting board. Okay. So this is um, reclaimed black walnut. Uh, it's about 100 years old from a barn in Ohio. And um, I had it made from a guy who we um, source uh, uh, reclaimed wood from in Irvington, New Jersey. It is called Real Antique Wood. Check out their website. They're award-winning and um, they tear down barns and they recycle the wood. And it's really, really pretty cool. Um, and it, you know what, it wasn't any more than if I went out and got a butcher block this size, you know? It was worth it. All right, we're going to lettuce now. Lettuce. Okay, J I would say Jay Judge agrees. He likes his, most of his steaks medium rare, dry aged, awesome. medium. Lettuce. I don't often eat iceberg lettuce. The only time I eat iceberg lettuce, when I make wedge salad. So when you're selecting the lettuce, you want the hardest one that you can find. You don't want, sometimes they're really soft. You really don't want that. You want a nice hard head of lettuce. You're gonna take off some of these outer leaves, super green ones, and, okay. This is a trick that I learned when I was working at a summer camp, like, like in high school. Um, when you had to do a lot of heads of lettuce, you've got the root here. Just take it and smack it down on the cutting board and then pull it out. Easy. Easy peasy. All right, so there are four of us. So guess what? We're going to cut this at the quarters. Right down the middle. And we're going to cut it this way. I do have another head if anybody wants more. And there you've got your beautiful wedge. Plate these up. Okay. That one. I'm going to use this one to show you guys what we're going to do. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put the dressing on, which I had made some earlier. So this is nice and chilled. Yeah, it's nice and thick and chunky. So we're gonna put a little bit of the dressing on. And just drizzle. The more the merrier, if you ask me. Mm-hmm. Alright, let's so you're doing it with, of course so it can soak into. I just started the bowl. It's always a good sign. Uh, Alright. I've got some little cherry tomatoes. Actually these are grape tomatoes. Cherry tomatoes are harder and harder to find. Just going to cut them in half. We're going to sprinkle them on top. Beautiful. Just stick them on. Beautiful thing. Okay, here I have, I made this for, I don't even remember. These are uh, pickled red onions. They go great on wedge salad. We're gonna take some, and we're gonna just put a couple on top. You got the little vinegar hit from these, but it's also sweet. And then of course, <laughs> Lynn's favorite thing, bacon. A little bit about the bacon. If you're not cooking your bacon in the oven, you're missing out. Put it on a sheet pan, 375, 400, let it go. This was thick cut bacon. You let it go for 15 minutes or so, you'll smell it. Flip them over another maybe five, six minutes and you get super great, crispy, you know, doesn't shrink much. So we are just going to break the bacon over the top. Again, there's no such thing as too much bacon on a wedge salad. And if you want to top it off with a little more dressing, and the first thing, when I got home, I was in the kitchen, Eric was in the other room, and he says to me, are you eating all the bacon? And I'm like, a little black <laughs> pepper, I love black pepper, it's my favorite thing. No need for salt, because you got the blue cheese dressing. How's that look? 
fabulous. Mm-hmm. So we'll do the rest of them later. And we're going to get to our steak. All right. And Gloria said, great idea, a nice garnish for the salad with your onions. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Now, I think I'm going to slice the steak and put them on the plates. All right. Now, let's talk about New York Strip and how to slice it. Um, where's my knife? It's hiding on me. All right, I want to show you this now. I'm going to come, see I'm, this? I'm, I'm, I'm going to zoom in. Zoom in. Just in. on your steak. Okay. So, the grain of the steak is going this way. So if we cut this way, we're cutting with the grain. You always want to cut against the grain. So what I do with the New York strip is I cut it in half. Okay. And then I turn the half and cut against the grain. Okay. You can do fancy if you want to set it up fancy like that for decorative purposes. Same thing here. Now steaks are all different, you know, thicknesses. So it's only natural that one one part might be a little more done than the other, but not so much. All right, there we go. This is going on the plate. I think Dave, your brother Dave is also on tonight, and I think he's disguising himself as your mom. Nice. Hi, Carol. David. David. I mean David. Do you trim the gristle? Nope. That's uh, individual preference. Nice little dollop of cream spinach on the plate. And your mom asked why, or maybe it was David, um, mom, Carol, slash David, asked why does uh, iceberg lettuce get such a bad rap? I don't know, because it uh, doesn't have a whole lot of inherent flavor. It's mostly water. I said it was nutritional content. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's see. Let's see what we got here. These are potato wedges, nice and crispy. They puffed up a little bit. They're really super crispy when they first come out of the oven. They do sog a little bit pretty quickly. So you want to try and time your meal. All right, so this is what we have. We have our delicious cream spinach our potato wedges, gorgeous, and we have our delicious 45 day dry aged steak, which of course I have to taste, right? So I'm also going to taste this awesome, this is one of my favorite things. Not just favorite salads, one of my favorite things. And so often you go out and you get it and it, it disappoints, this one does not disappoint. The cool thing about going out to dinner with Eric is that when food disappoints, the next day becomes makeup session. So he then makes whatever failed All at right. the restaurant. Here we go. It's good. I am gonna try this beef. It's got a beautiful char on it. You can smell the charcoal. You can smell the dry aged taste, the flavor. Mm. Mm. Really delicious. Needs a little bit of salt. Actually, you know what? Let's use this. What is salt? Malden sea salt. It's a finishing salt. A little chunkier, a little flakier. Another British ingredient. Mm hmm. <laughs> From the coast of the Malden Sea. Yep. Goes really well when you get the smoked stuff. Yeah. All right. So that was really good. Very tender, juicy, dry aged beef. You know, because it's dry aged does not necessarily mean it's not going to be juicy. Absolutely tender and juicy. Great dry aged flavor. Again, 45 days. 
Some people have a higher tolerance for more. Some people like less, but 45 days for me is spot on. All right, our spinach. Mm. So why mold in sea salt as you're finishing? It's a little bit sweeter. It's a flake, so it's a, it, it adds this, this crunch that regular salt doesn't give you. You know, if you use a bigger salt grain that's, a, that's like a, a cube, it's hard to chew. This is actually a flake. Um, I guess it happens in the drying process yep. when it crystallizes. So it's very tender, it's a very tender salt, you know, so you can crush it and make fine salt out of it, but why would you want to do that? All right, let me taste these potatoes real quick. And the question from Gloria, how long did it take you to bake those potato wedges? These potato wedges took about 40 minutes, 35 minutes. It depends how big the potato wedge is. But it was about 35. Yeah, so it was about 35 minutes. And uh, mm. Walton Woods was asking how much coconut oil, do you, or, or he uses coconut oil first, what's your block, what do you use? I use uh, straight up mineral oil. But you also use a disinfectant? And yeah, so things. I clean it first, I let it dry, then I spray it with a disinfecting, like a sanitizer, and then let that air dry, and then I will do a coat of mineral oil. So no taste, no flavor. It's food safe. All right, let's go with this dressing here. A little bacon, a little onion. Mm. You've got lots of yums and yums and great show and... Awesome. So, I'm going to plate up the rest of this. Again, I want to express my gratitude to you. Oh, Lynn. What's for dinner next week? Interrupting the outros very bad. Uh, I, I know, but what's for dinner next week? Paul Taboni needs to know. All right, Paul, usually I don't know, but I made, I'm sure you saw what I made for lunch the other day, a teriyaki and salmon belly. Man, I gotta show you guys how to make that. Cause it's so easy and it's so good. It's real quick, you're gonna love it. So next week is teriyaki salmon belly. And folks were asking for fish and... And folks were asking for fish. I couldn't get Perfect. enough of it on, on, on Monday. So, yeah, so. we're going to... It's a really good, healthy... Lynn said she could eat it every day. And uh, so we'll talk more about it next week. But, yeah, so, again, I express my gratitude. Um, you guys make this show. It, you uh, inspire me, you know, throughout the week. Please post what you're cooking, what you're eating on uh, eating... Um, not eating, on the... Uh, Grateful Chef with Eric Eisenbud. Get people to follow us. Go on our Instagram, uh, you know, the Grateful Chef underscore EE. And, um, you know, share your love for food as I share my love for food with you. So, again, I say to you be nice, be kind, be grateful, cook well, and uh, eat well. And we will see you. You have something to say? Yeah. Before I sign off, nope. we will see you next week on the next episode of Cooking in the Grateful Chef Kitchen with Eric Eisenberg. Peace.